All right, we hope to have some opportunities during the day to have some group questions. We're going to play that by ear, but uh, please contact the speakers you're interested in asking questions of. Um, I'm really excited about our next two talks, both focusing on controlled pollinations. I think this is an incredible tool, especially in British Columbia as we look for more specialized programs, especially as we look for pest resistance beyond volume. So our first speaker is Stephen Goodfellow, and you all have very complete uh, bios of people, so I'm being very brief in terms of what I'm saying because you don't want me reading up here. Um, so Stephen Goodfellow. And I think you have a, another mic and this yep. goes Am I hot? Testing? All right. Well, good morning, guys. Um, I don't think I won the award for traveling the farthest, but uh, I came from Texas, um, so I, I trap a little, little ways out here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about CMP in the southeast and how we're effective with it. Um, little, press the green one. Ben, the controller here, is that on? Sorry, guys. Did we start putting in the computer, maybe? Okay, we'll get through this. Um, yeah, so a little background on me. I got my undergrad in forestry at a small school in East Texas. I got a master's at Mississippi State in forest genetics. Started out my career with IFCO seedlings. You guys may be a little bit more familiar with them now that PRT has acquired them. Um, I worked in R&D with Warehouser and uh, I now work for PRT and IFCO. Jump to our next slide. We'll talk about southern pine species a little bit, um, grafted seed orchards and their designs, CMP practices, and that's going to include CMP bag types, uh, pollen handling, CMP equipment, and then kind of some differences with OP and CMP product classes. So in the southeast, we deal with, main, with four main pine species. Um, the most important one is, is Lobolly pine. That's our cash cow. Over a billion uh, seedlings are planted a year with loblolly, um, although we do still work with shortleaf slash and, uh, and longleaf. So our orchards, much like y'all's, are, are, uh, are all grafted seed orchards. Once genetic selections have been tested and identified as being uh, ideal forward selections, we'll graft them into our seed orchards. So each, of these, uh, each, each one of these ramettes are genetically the same. They're clones. Some cones are desirable because of their genetic attributes and what they can pass along, but also some we identify as important for CMP. And that's because they produce maybe large amounts of pollen or also are prolific flowers. Um, these orchards are very intensively managed. Um, I only have 20 minutes to talk about CMP. I could go into an hour and a half, two hours about uh, Loblolly seed production and orchard management, uh, but just know that they are very intensely managed. As far as designs are concerned, we also consider at orchard establishment um, how CMP is going to impact our orchards. So from a design standpoint, we can maximize our efficiency with things like clonal rows. These are done as uh, a, a short clonal rows or long clonal rows. Sometimes they're two, they're paired clonal rows. And the advantage that that gives us is that it's just operationally efficient for our, our uh, workers to come through and pollinate down that line. They can work left to the right, or they can work their way all the way down one line. Um, so as they're going through these practices of collecting cones and placing bags, they're very efficient. Now, from an OP standpoint, this is going to maximize our pollen cloud, right? So we're going to be able to get diversified pollen mating occurring there. We're not so concerned in our CMP blocks because we know that we're going to be bagging those flowers. The ones that aren't bagged, we're removing from the trees, and we're going to be creating our own crosses. Um, so certainly there's some, some new concepts with orchard designs that are going to maximize efficiency, but we also have a mixture of both within our company. So what is control mass pollinated or control mass pollinated. People have a lot of different terminologies for this. Mass control pollination, 
but the idea is the same. It's just controlled breeding, just like what you do in a genetic uh, tree improvement program. So we're, we know who mother is. We're placing controlled bags, controlled breeding bags on the mothers. We're injecting pollen. But rather on a research scale, we're doing this operationally. So we're doing hundreds of thousands of bags. Because of that, we're less concerned about contamination. When we're doing research breeding, we're very concerned about contamination. We're concerned about how pure our pollen is. We're concerned about what, what the timing is at bag removal. With, con with a CMP process, we're less controlled about, or concerned about that because we know this is gonna be a mass-produced product. And generally in agriculture, you can look at corn, soybeans, you see a contamination rate of around five to six percent. And that's something that we're comfortable with to, to work with as well. So if we're contaminating our seed at, at the end of the day, we're also still doing it with that same mother tree. So we know that the contamination, that five or six percent, is still a function of an open pollinated uh, female from that elite selection. So we know who mom is, we know who dad is, we're breeding them on the operational scale, and we have a lot of tools to do that with. And one of them is a type of CMP bags that we use. Some of you guys may be familiar with PBS. Um, this is a, a wonderful company. They do a great job across the world with tree breeding, plant breeding, um, bag types. And there's some advantages to them. Um, in comparison, there's also a craft paper bag option, Lawson bags, or uh, I think Midco, uh, owns, owns that patent now. And they're more of a one-time use type of product, whereas your white PBS bags you can, you can use multiple times. There's a cost difference between the two. Craft paper bag is pretty cheap. You can do that for about 15 cents, whereas our PBS bags that are, are reusable are about a buck 50 coming out of, can or coming out of the UK. So the advantages with these white bags is that, hey, look, we can get some reduced bag rub. We can reduce our flower damage. We can get a little bit better retention. And they go up quick. As a lot of you guys know, working on Mother Nature's time clock is, it's challenging. So there are times when you're pushing a lot of work, a lot of crews that, are, that have been working tireless, tirelessly to, to achieve the goals that we have set forth. To have something that's reusable and that we can put up quickly is ideal. Whereas our craft paper bags, we can, we can use them one time, but they're a little bit slower to put up. Oftentimes they're reinforced with an aluminum wire, and that wire just helps support that branch tiplet so that there's not as much bag rub that occurs. From equipment standpoint, I'm sure many of you guys in this room are familiar with aerial boom lifts. Um, so all this breeding activity that occurs happens 25 meters up in the air. Uh, you guys may be running one, two, three, five, six lifts. We run over 100 each year. Uh, and and some, of, some of our sites run about 25 to 30 at a time. Um, the reason that that's important is because this is a big financial component of CMP right here. Just the investment in this equipment alone is, is, is a lot. There's options that we can go with, um, different providers, and I'm happy to talk about that with anybody who's interested in going down this avenue. Um, there's certainly different equipment and, and uh, and, and different providers that do better services than others, but uh, overall, the aerial boom lifts are key to CMP processes. Now, orchards that get larger and taller than 85 feet, or what am I? What is that in meters? There, about 25 meters. They become genetically obsolete for us because in order to get a 120 foot or uh, a, thir a 35 meter lift out on our site. They're heavy, they're expensive, they get stuck. And nothing fun happens when you're that, that high up in the air. They're also a risk from a, from a safety standpoint. So at that point, once our orchards are no longer able to be reached with an 85 or a 25 meter lift, we, we rug them out, we're done with them. We cut them to the ground and start over. And our lifts get stuck. In the southeast, it's, it's wet conditions. Most of our orchards are in sandy loams or sandy sites. They don't necessarily hold a lot of moisture, but we do have low pitfalls. We do have old stump holes, and, and it can be tough. Now, there are some advantages and some options out there, like this, this uh, track lift, this quad track lift, um, more expensive. But if you're working in an environment or an orchard that you know is problematic, 
it's advantageous to go ahead and just invest in this equipment up front. We work in such a small time window that when a lift is stuck or a lift is broken or it's down, it, we can't stop Mother Nature. She's still moving. So it's up to us to, to manage for this and some of, some of the tools and options that we have is to go ahead and invest up front in a, in a quad track lift. But getting stuck isn't the only challenge that we deal with in the southeast. And this is in an orchard in, in Louisiana where they happen to have this 12 foot alligator come walking through the orchard while they were doing CMP. So you can see some of the bags up top. Um, so yeah, we, we've got quite a few quite a few challenges. So from a pollen handling standpoint, um, we're injecting pollen into our bags. We know who mom is, we know who dad is. We're making this controlled cross that we, that we know it's performance. We're injecting about a cc per application. And when we do this, we're evaluating that flower's, the, the flower's uh, susceptibility to being pollinated. So we do it about two or three times just to ensure that all the flowers inside of that bag become pollinated because there is variability. Some years are, are tougher than others as well. Some years we have a lot of variability across uh, flower development stages. Um, so bags are marked. You can see that, you can see that on, the, on that last slide. We spray paint a, a little X on there and come back and spray paint it another color again once that's done. And that way we can we can keep up with uh, what bags have been pollinated and which haven't. So during the, the period that all this is going on, we're putting up bags, we're collecting pollen, we're applying pollen. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts that are going on. Um, so one of the activities that's important is ensuring that we get pollen for the next year. So we're using a year old pollen. We'd love to use fresh pollen. If that was an option, I'd do it every single time because you get better retention, seed set, and, and seed yield, but it's just not operationally, logistically feasible. So what we'll do is we'll start to collect pollen for that next year and we'll make plans as far as what those, those uh, pollen needs are. And catkins are collected, they're clipped off of the branches. We're working with, a, with, with pine and so we're able to remove those catkins from the trees and then they're shaken, they're dried down and shaken um, into a fine powder. They're dried down in these giant, these giant rooms, um, our pollen drying rooms, and uh, real fancy terminology there. But we're shooting for, for low relative humidity and 95 degrees. Um, and you can see that's, that's uh, Doug Sharp there. Um, Doug is the, uh, uh, he was the COO of uh, uh, IFCO, and now he's taken on a vice, uh, uh, vice president VP role within PRT. We can jump to the next. So, so pollen storage, once they're dried down and they're shaken down into that fine powder, we store them into, into liter containers and put them in the freezer. Our target is less than 10% moisture content. And we go ahead and, and run an analysis to ensure that. Anything larger than, than 10%, that water will freeze, shatters, crystalline structure and destroys and degrades the pollen, just like it would in seed. Uh, we, we test all of our pollen. This is important if we're spending the time to get up there, if we're spend, spending the time to put these bags up, we need to ensure that the pollen that we're applying is of the best vigor and the best germination possible. So what we'll do is we test every single liter of pollen that comes in, excuse me, and we'll look at the width of the pollen grain, and then we'll look at that tube, come, that pollen tube extending off of it to determine its viability. We only use pollen that's 80% germ or better from this sampling method. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what we'll end up using for, for CMP, right? The rest gets tossed away. So comparing these two options, um, I know traditionally doing seed orchard mixes, doing maybe single family collections of OP is common out here. Uh, maybe it's mostly just, just seed orchard mixes. But some of the advantages that, that we have from this open pollinate is that you do get that diversity, right? You do get uh, a wider planting zone. We get, we get the option to go ahead and, and produce this seed at a pretty relatively cheaper cost anyhow um, than, than CMP. So moving on to CMP, what are the advantages in the comparison there? 
And again, CMP, MCP, ECP, you'll hear this terminology thrown everywhere. It's all the same concept. It's just mass-produced controlled crosses. Um, some of the pros are we get the best genetic gain option out of here. We can determine what SCA is. We can look at what the specific combining ability is of these particular crosses. And then if you want to bulk them up into multiple crosses in order to meet your diversity goals, they're there. To, to be able to do that, we can now attack disease issues. We can now attack things like uh, assisted migration in a, in a strategic way, not just a generalized um, what's, what's flowing in the open pollen cloud direction. So we know who mom is, we know who dad is, they're both tested, they're both well known. The cons, it is less genetically diverse, it's more expensive, and they're very, they have more uh, varying specific planning zones. So that's a general comparison. Now if we look at the markets in the southeast, you can jump to the next slide, the annual production of these CMP crosses, the trend of that, 180 million seedlings were produced last year. You guys remember how many seedlings I said were produced a year? One billion? And 18% of them are done as controlled crosses? That's pretty influential. And, and look at the trend here. In about 2012, the production of these controlled crosses has skyrocketed in the southeast. And, and a function of that is the genetic value that they bring to the table, not just in growth, but in, in disease resistance, in insect resistance, in tree form and stem form. Our, uh, oh, that's all right. Um, the, annual, the annual production of CMP bags over the years, this is pretty interesting. So every group like ourselves, every other company that's invested in producing these, these CMP crosses, this is the number of bags that they placed annually. So in 2016, about 1.5 million bags. Last year, it was almost 2.8 million bags. So think about the effort whenever you've done your breeding responsibilities and you put up 150 bags or 200 bags and you say, gosh, that was a tough year. <laughs> over 2 million, guys, over 2 million, 2.6 in 2021. How is this done? It's done through a lot of strategic planning intensive labor activities, the utilization of H2B, H2A workers, and, and a strong, solid foundation in planning in the process. So that's all I've got. Um, again, I could go on for an hour and a half on this, but if there's any questions, you guys feel free to give me a holler, pull me aside, happy to field them. Two questions, please. Two questions. <laughs> thanks thanks for your talk uh really enjoyed that i was wondering do you do any topping to manage that height you just let the trees go straight through and my other quick question is i'm sorry i cannot i can't hear that might have been my fault you didn't hear? hear you uh do you do any topping of the trees to manage topping. the height and do you pollinate every other day when you do your three times yeah so from a pruning standpoint we, we do not prune the tops of our, of our pine trees. Their apical dominance is too strong. In fact, you'll end up doing more damage and get wind throw damage. Uh, it's been tested, it's been tried. I wish we could keep them shorter, <laughs> uh, but they like to grow, so we'll let, we'll let them do their thing. And then your second question was Just the, pollination the, for the, other day. the timing of pollination. And so we're looking for, for maximum recepti receptivity in that bag. And so it depends. Some days it might be every other days. Some day it may be every third day. It really depends on the timing of that, that flower phenology and how that year is going. And year to year, there's a lot of differences. Uh, the idea though is once we get that third shot, if we need that third shot, we're pulling those bags off. Because at that point, that pollen grain has entered that position that it, it can no longer, op an open pollinated pollen grain can't just come along and impact that, that uh, that pollination period that it's already occurred. One more question. I did say yoder bark, but I didn't really expect her to listen to me. <laughs> Hi. Uh, are you doing any assisted migration in the sense that using pollen from, I don't know, southern locations or something like that to compensate climatic change? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, of course, this needs to be tested rigorously before it's taken to a commercial scale. 
And that's something that we've done in the South is looking at taking wide zone crosses to, t to bring about the benefits of, of both of those, um, th those providences. So in the Southeast, we have providences that grow very strong, but they may have disease susceptibility. Whereas you may have one that has no disease susceptibility at all, very resistant to fusiform rust but maybe its growth characteristics aren't as strong as, as another provenance is. So what we'll do is do a wide cross and then go test them across geographic areas to see how they perform. And I think that's an important thing to take away that especially species like loblolly pine and Douglas fir, these are the most genetically diverse species in the world. So we have opportunity to make gains and we have opportunities to prepare for diseases and impacts that we may come across. I think I heard pitch canker talked about a little bit earlier this today. That's a problem for us in the Southeast, a significant one. And so in order to, to combat these uh, problems that we're going to face, we have to have the tools and, and we need to use the tools that we have at our resources. And one of that is controlled breeding and making selections. All right. Thank you guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, appreciate you letting me take the time to talk to you guys a little bit about what we do at J.D. Irving Limited. So I'm the supervisor at Parkendale Seed Orchard with J.D. Irving Limited. My name is Courtney. Um, so I was born and raised in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Um, I got my forest technician diploma with the Maritime College of Forest Technology, and then I moved on to the University of New Brunswick to get my Bachelor of Science in Forestry. Um, I've been with J.D. Irving for two years now. I've always been kind of interested in the, the growing part of, of the industry and silviculture, for example. So I was really honored to be able to join the orchard in the last two years and then just last June took over as supervisor. So still on my journey to tree improvement and hopefully getting to where some of you are today with, uh, with tree improvement. Um, so J.D. Irving Limited, um, we're part of the Woodlands Division. We are vertically integrated. Um, we've been in business since 1882 and have 16,000 employees. So the really nice thing about that is um, being vertically integrated is we can work very closely with our nursery, um, with our foresters too that were technically our customers that we're providing the seed to. Um, so we do have a lot of advantages when it comes to, you know, following uh, the supply chain, um, especially when it comes down to site selection for the seedlings and putting the um, best genetic seeds on our sites that we're managing. We manage um, some freehold land as well as some crown land in New Brunswick as well. So Parkendale Seed Orchard, um, we're located in Elgin, New Brunswick. We have about 270 acres. Um, we have spruce and pine orchards. We have red spruce, black spruce, white spruce, uh, Norway spruce, white pine, and jack pine. So it's nice to have a variety of species to work with because we're constantly learning about these different species um, and trying to perfect our breeding programs as well. Um, our first, first orchards were planted around 1980 on site. We have our orchard, cone shed, and our seed extractory is right on site at Parkendale Seed Orchard. Um, we do have a, a nursery site that's located just about 30, 35 minutes down the highway, but it's really nice to have our seed extractory right on site so we're not transporting the cones too far. We collect them, store them in our cone shed, and then they're basically ready uh, for our own processing as we can get to them throughout the winter. So we do a lot of controlled mass pollination. Um, with our, with our white spruce especially, um, some with our uh, other species like Norway spruce too, but our main focus is on white spruce. So we're looking to capture superior, uh, superior genetic um, volume gains, insect resistance, and breeding our desirable clones together. So we're just gonna run through kind of the steps of how we conduct controlled mass pollination at J.D. Irving Limited. Um, so first we're going to monitor the clones for flowers and pollen buds. So we'll go out, we'll, we'll get one of the aerial lifts um, that Stephen was talking about and we'll check, we'll check the trees and we're looking for which clones, are, which clones have flowers, which clones have pollen. Um, identifying the desirable clones to cross. So even though we might have a lower genetic clone that has all kinds of flowers, that still might not be our top priority 
for um, breeding that particular tree. So we're um, kind of going down the list of our clones from superior genetics to, um, to lesser and trying to breed at the top of our list with the superior genetics. We're going to track the flower and pollen bud development. So once we decided which female clones we're going to be crossing with our pollen, we're going to then track them and the flower development. Once the um, buds, once the, the flowers are ready to be bagged at the beginning of May, we'll go ahead and we'll bag those with um, our crew of summer hires. We do have um, a number of folks on our team that are um, full-time year-round. However, we do have to recruit quite a bit of labor to get that main CMP done in the springtime. So we'll, oh, sorry. Um, so we'll track the flower and pollen, uh, or sorry, the flower and bud development. Then we'll conduct our pollinations around mid-May. Uh, we're finding that year to year, we're right around that May 20th mark. So we're also tracking our growing degree days to see when those pollinations should take place. Um, but we're tracking the flowers every single day. We're looking at the stage that they're at. Um, we're testing our pollen, making sure that it's ready, especially when those flowers are receptive and good to go. Um, we'll also conduct one and two pollinations. If there was time allowing, we might even do a third. However, we haven't gotten there uh, this year. Collect, uh, so then we'll collect our pollen. We also do clippings, as Stephen mentioned, um, with their group. So we'll go ahead, clip the pollen. Um, we'll put it in our pollen drying room. Our pollen drying room is quite small, though. Uh, we're not quite there yet. However, um, we'll put our boxes in the pollen drying room, ensure that the temperature is consistent, relative humidity, and we'll be tracking um, the moisture content of it as well before we store it, if we are storing it. And then near the end of May, we're going to remove the bags from the trees once we're sure that each one of the clones has closed up. This year, we noticed that even one, if we have two different clones that are side by side, one of them might be further developed than the other. So you might have one clone or one cone, clone of cones that are fully closed and the other one may not be. So it's really important to check each tree. And we also found differences from block to block. So we kind of have a white spruce one block and a white spruce two block. And both of those blocks are not gonna be at the exact same rate. There's just slightly difference, there's slight differences in the slope, slight differences in the nutrients that are available, um, wind, all that stuff. So it's really important to track each block, each clone, and even, even between rows to ensure that they're at the stage we want to remove the bags. Um, and then we'll go ahead and we'll collect the cones in the fall. So this was um, some pictures of our flowers that I took this year. Um, right from when they're still developing and kind of elongating as buds through to when they start to open up and then to when they close again. Uh, the flowers are that bright red color, but the ones that we put the bags over, they turn a little bit green. That doesn't seem to impact, um, that doesn't seem to impact the seed set, for example, but they just change colors uh, a little bit when they're not exposed to that sunlight throughout that entire month of May. Um, pollen collection. So, so we do our clippings. This is some of the white spruce pollen that we were um, clipping just this spring here. So we'll put it in our pollen drying room. We're gonna test our quality too. So um, we, have, we have a lab that's in um, Sussex that's not far from our, from our site there. So they'll help us a lot with our pollen testing, make sure we have the right equipment to do so. And then storage. We have, um, we have a, a couple freezers at, the, at our site at Parkendale Seed Orchard. We also have kind of a backup of our pollen as well at, at our Sussex site, and that's just to ensure that, you know, if anything were to happen, that we do have that backup, so that's important to have. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about the logistics and kind of how we conducted it uh, this year as well. So we did have um, a number of lifts on site. We're, we're nowhere near 100 uh, by any means, but it could be five to 15, for example, depending on um, what our crop is looking like and our crew size as well. So we're trying to pollinate with fresh pollen as much as possible, not always possible. So usually the flowers that you wanna pollinate, the pollen is gonna be ready at the same time for collection as the flowers are ready for pollinations. So it's a, it's a bit of a balance, collecting that pollen with one team and providing it to the other team so that they can, can use it. We were lucky that we do have a, a, a decent amount of stored pollen as well. So we can start off with our stored pollen and then use fresh pollen as it's processed and ready to go for our pollinations. Um, 
We'll, we'll typically do one and two pollinations. We would have liked to have tried a third just to see if that impacted our, our seed set and um, our, our yields, but we didn't get a chance to do a third one this year. But we were able to do pollinations uh, the first and second round. So that way we can ensure that we're capturing um, the, that way we can ensure that we're capturing the, the flowers when they're ready to receive the pollen. So typically we, we've noticed that it's over several days, maybe like five to six days. So if we pollinate on day one and two, when we're certain that the, that the flowers are receptive and they're ready, we'll wait a day or two, and then we'll go ahead and do the entire orchard again. So that way we're capturing that entire time frame for pollinations. Um, one thing that we ran into this year was some adverse weather. So typically, when we've conducted uh, CMP, the weather's been really good in May. Um, might have a little bit of rain, but, but not too bad. This year, we had um, kind of an extreme wind and rain event that occurred right in the middle of our pollinations, between pollination one and two. Um, the biggest thing there for us is using the bags that we use. So we have been using the craft paper bags. And so we'll use various sizes, small bags and large bags. So what we're noticing is that with a large bag, we can capture a lot more flowers on a branch. On your spruce, you might have quite a few clusters of flowers. So those large bags are able to capture all kinds of flowers. The only issue with that is that should there be um, a wind storm, for example, your larger bags are gonna act like a sail in, in those events. So, so you might lose a, a couple bags, for example. We were, we were fortunate that we didn't lose too many, but definitely um, provided us with some information to next year to maybe move towards more medium-sized bags, double-checking zip tie uh, strength on the branches, and little, little improvements like that that we can make to ensure that it's not as much of an issue. Um, we, we get a lot of questions about the, the rain. Well, how does the rain impact the bags? Um, typically, they'll just dry out again and, and you're good to go. So your bags will dry out uh, with the flowers inside and you can still pollinate um, when the time is ready. So there's a number of those improvements that we'll be uh, using going into 2024. Some other examples of some improvements that we've made are some tally sheets. So we're getting our crew to track how many bags that they're putting on tree so we can find some parameters like how many seeds per tree are we getting, how many seeds per cone, seeds per bag, and some interesting parameters like that that will help us move forward with our program. Um, so cone and seed extraction. So once our cones are collected um, in the fall, they're placed in these trays that we store in our cone shed. So we'll put about four hectoliters in uh, per tray. So they're collected, they're stored in our cone shed. Everything's processed on our site. We typically have one to three people that are helping operate our, um, our seed extractory depending on the crop size that year. So uh, we're very fortunate having our seed processing right on site. And depending on what our crop size is, we could be in there for a month, could be up to three months. So, so we're really trying to ensure that we have enough staff that can keep that flow moving throughout the winter. And um, yeah, and this was just some of the cones that we had collected this past, uh, this past fall. Uh, this is our extra extractory itself. So our stages um, into our kiln, this is our top photo there, uh, into our tumbler, scalper, dewinging, liquid, sizer, and gravity. Um, we've been visiting a number of uh, seed extractories uh, across Canada, I would say, Quebec, BC, and we've noticed that a lot of the equipment is pretty well the same equipment depending on size, few minor differences. So seed care, so I know we had the January workshop working on you know, uh, germination improvements, so we've been really focused on that our, ourselves. So we want to ensure that every seed gets to reach its full germination potential. We have an, an initiative to improve orchard practices as well as handling and care practices to increase our germination capacity. So some of our considerations. Um, the, you'll notice the seed on the screen there, that's actually a Norway spruce seed, not white spruce seeds. Just want Clarify that I'm aware of that. <laughs> um, extractory processing steps. So there's a lot of things that we can do within our processing, collection, and timing to ensure that we can have um, the, the most viable seed possible. So the processing stages. If there's a stage that we can eliminate so that there's less impact on the seed, that we'll do that. So there was one thing that we noticed in Quebec is that they moved away from their liquid, liquid separation step, and that's something that we'd like to do going forward for the fragile seeds. Um, temporary storage. So previously, seed had been stored and left in our extractory in between stages. So one thing that we built this year was kind of a cold room. So it's just a room that's kept above, above zero. 
but um, probably like two to four degrees to ensure that the seed is cool in between stages. And that way we're not heating the seed up and impacting um, that biological activity within it. Container types is another thing that we've been talking a lot about lately. So we have plastic containers that we're stored in. However, the, there's a lot of space, like as we're using the seed, you might have a little bit of air space within those containers, increasing potential for moisture. Um, we wanna make sure our seeds are between four and 8% for storage. So we have a really considering changing our container types to potentially bags where we can decrease the amount of moisture within the bags, ensuring that our seeds are, for, are viable for as long as possible. Um, just general handling practices when we're transporting seed, we'll ensure that the seed stays in a cooler with ice when we're taking it to the nursery. Even if we're just collecting samples from our seed freezer and bringing it into um, our facility to be tested, we want to make sure that we're keeping it in lunch bags with, with ice packs and anything that we can do to ensure that the seed is going to stay um, as viable as possible. So germination improvement considerations, um, the environment setting. So we had previously used a 24 hour light cycle. We're going to uh, move away from that and in incorporating dark cycles to mimic the natural environment a little, uh, a little more. Temperature, we've doing, been doing some experiments with temperature and 23 degrees seems to be uh, the sweet spot uh, for our species and the relative humidity as well. We're really fortunate that we purchased a new Convirin this year which can really help us dial in the environment for our germination. Chemical assistance as well. Um, you know, we'll, we'll treat our seed before they're germ tested with um, peroxide, for example. We wanna make sure that there's not gonna be any mold that's growing on that seed in the germination cabinet. Um, there's some other literature out there that, that, we've, that we noticed that we might wanna try. For example, soaking the seeds in a chemical uh, GA that we had talked about previously in some other presentations. So that's something that we're looking into. Um, haven't had any final results on it yet, but definitely anything that we can do to improve, uh, to improve that, that seed so we're not wasting seed and um, that every seed can germinate to its full potential. And we wanna min minimize the agitation process too. So even when we're getting our sample seed, we wanna make sure that they're not being squished into a lunch bag with, with all kinds of them and that's impacting the seed coat because any little nicks on the seed coat or anything like that could impact that seed. Um, longer term improvements, so some equipment considerations for us, we want to make sure that our seed is as pure as possible when we're sending it to our nursery. So um, considering a, gra a gravity table, I know some of your sites have those and that way we'll be able to separate out uh, smaller size seed, medium size seed and large size seeds relatively rapid. A spare extractory motor, just little things like that so we can ensure that if there's any equipment that's down during our processing, we'll have, some, we'll have a, a spare motor that we can put right in there that there's no downtime and that the seeds aren't sitting longer or that the cones aren't sitting longer than they should be for processing as well. Um, as well as a microscope, we have microscopes but not specifically at the orchard that exactly meet our needs for checking pollen um, and, and all those types of things. So there's definitely some improvements that we can make with our equipment and the overall orchard itself, nutrient regime, ensuring that we're fertilizing and checking the nutrients of each block because each block is gonna have different needs, especially based on its slow position um, and uh, its slow position as well as sunlight. Irrigation regime, so on any of our small blocks are gonna have irrigation lines in them. So our smallest trees, we wanna ensure that they have the, the most care possible. As the trees get older, we'll remove irrigation lines, but we wanna try some trials with um, irrigation in those larger trees as well and see if that can improve um, embryo development within our seeds and other seed factors. Compaction as well, we have quite a number of aerial lifts that we'll bring into our orchard as we're con uh, conducting our CMP program. We wanna make sure that we're going through the orchard with as minimal passes as possible. Every pass with the lifts creates more compaction and we notice that if we were to leave one of the, the lifts in the block overnight, you can see that it will settle just slightly into the ground. So we wanna make sure at the end of the day, all the lifts are getting pulled out of the blocks. And your heavier lifts, the, like your 80 foot boom lifts are gonna be that much heavier than the 60 foot boom lifts. So if we can reach the tops with our 60s, we're not gonna go ahead and get any 80 foot lifts, especially for um, budget, budget wise as well. 
Also for uh, competition within the orchard, any weeds and stuff that you have are going to compete for those nutrients, are gonna compete for water. So we, we make sure that we, we mow our orchard, that we're not having all that competition, especially with our new blocks that we're establishing. And integrated pest management, uh, we want to make sure that we have as minimal cone and seed insects as possible, whether that means picking last year's cones to ensure that it's not a haven for cone and seed insects to um, anything else that we can do to reduce pests. So if we're roguing an orchard and we're cutting out all of our lower genetic trees, we want to make sure that all the materials pulled off site. If we can cut the stumps down, we will. And it's just less, um, it's less of a habitat for any of those pests to live in our orchard. Any, any questions? Okay. Thank you. I, I'm sorry again, we're going to have to move on with the program. We have three more speakers before lunch, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Victoria Lee. She's our testing supervisor at the BC Tree Seed Centre. I think just in the name of time and for lunch, I think uh, I'm going to take full responsibility for packing the schedule a little too tight. Um, so I'll make sure that Dave and Victoria have as much time. And Martin is actually presenting on some of the work I was going to talk a little bit about tomorrow. So if you want to visit his talk on butternuts. And if, if anybody wants to raise their hands who wants to hear about exceptional, weird, rare hardwood species, I can get. I have all your emails so I can. Uh, we can do a webinar at something at another point. So I will. Do that so we all have enough time for lunch. A little short. Can I take this stuff now? Yeah. I don't have to do anything with it, it's on. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Testing, testing, one, two, three. I was asked to think of a snappy title. Um, I'm Victoria Lay. I'm the testing supervisor at the Tree Seed Center. Um, that's in Surrey, BC. And I'm just here to talk about basically what do we do in the seed testing laboratory. Uh, hands up, who's actually toured the Tree Seed Center? A fair number of you, so this might seem a little repetitive. Oh. Oh, this is, can it go back? Yeah. Ah, I see. Okay, so our main functions are testing for sea lot registration, free tests, quality assurance trials, as well as client requests. Just some history, the Tree Seed Center was first established in Duncan on Vancouver Island in the 1950s. Um, the government at that time recognized the need to ensure a continuous supply of good tree seed. Um, so that's a picture. And in 1986, the Tree Seed Center, a new facility was built in Surrey, BC, and seven staff from Duncan actually moved to Surrey to work there. And today, we have about 13 regular full-time staff and maybe five auxiliary staff during the processing season, depending on, on the cone crop of the year. This is just a staff photo from a few weeks ago. And this is the seed testing lab. Um, that's Laura Boyvin, Benix Holman, neither of whom wanted to show their faces because they're shy. Uh, yep. This is our germinator room. We have seven germinators. Um, as uh, Courtney mentioned, they can be set to different temperature and light regimes. And we also have a lab cooler, the door in the back. That's where we do all our cold stratification for our tests. Okay. Um, so if you're, I know some people are from other countries, if you're not familiar, the BC Tree Seed Center is often referred to as the crown jewel of BC's three forestation program. Basically, cone crops are collected and then shipped to the Tree Seed Center where their uh, process extracted to form seed lots. The seed lots get tested by us in the seed testing lab, and then they get stored in the negative 18 freezer. And whenever someone makes a seedling request, the seed gets withdrawn, prepared, and then shipped out to the nurseries to be grown. Oh, sorry. Why does it keep going forward? Okay. 
Um, so, okay, we follow the chief forester standards for seed use, which basically says we must test um, the seed purity, the weight of the seeds, the moisture content, and germination capacity. And I'll go into this a bit later, um, these standards that they stipulate. Okay. Um, we follow International Seed Testing Association rules, which provide standardized procedures for sampling, um, germination test regimes, tolerance tables, and many other details. We're not actually certified, um, but we do refer a lot to them. And we also refer to AOSA, that's Association Official Seed Analyst rules as well. We have some in-house improvements. We feel that we do better for some deeply dormant species. For example, we'll do longer stratification on that. And the pie chart is just a breakdown of our testing activities. Most of our time is spent doing what we call standard tests. So those are the tests that actually need, um, that you actually need for a seed lot registration. So um, that's moisture content, purity seeds per gram, and germination. Those results get uploaded to SPAR. So this is a screenshot um, from SPAR. And the germination and the seeds per gram value are what allow you to calculate how many grams of seed you actually need um, if you know how many seedlings you want. And at the bottom, there are just germination retests. So, um, once seed lots are stored in long-term storage, we actually do go back and retest the germination um, regularly just to make sure that's up to date. And we've had some seed lots from like the 80s, which are still doing really well. Um, this is just to show that most of our activities are centered around preparing and performing germination testing. Um, mainly, it's mainly a lot more because of all those retests. So how do you go about um, testing seed? First, you need to sample. So the keywords are random and repre representative. Your result will only ever be as good as your sample. Typically, that means we do one to three samples per container, depending on the number of containers. Um, to make a composite sample, that gets blended really well, and then we take our testing sample from that. So the first test we do is moisture content. <laughs> So you take two replicates of five grams each for most species. Um, it's a bit less for really light, really small seeded species. Um, the replicates are dried back in the oven for 103 degrees Celsius overnight. And in the morning, we'll check the moisture content. Um, so the legislation stipulates that they must be between four to 9.9% .9 um, in moisture content for testing to proceed. Realistically, if it's over 8%, we will dry it back just to make sure it's safe for long-term freezer storage. Yeah. And we've also started doing water activity. So the oven moisture content test is a destructive test because you're drying back the seed in the oven, but water activity is non-destructive. You're basically using the principle of equilibrium relative humidity. Um, to estimate moisture content. And this is really helpful when you have really small seed lots or genetic conservation samples where you really do not want to destroy any seed at all. And we've been trying to um, do this on every single seed lot so we get more data points and we'll relate that to moisture content so we can create our own curves for each species. So if moisture content is good, you can move on to purity. Technicians will manually separate the seed from any debris. Debris can include cone scales, needles, pitch, anything that they weren't able to remove in processing. Um, if it is below 97%, then we will send it back to cone and seed processing, um, ask them, can you rerun this? Can you get more debris out? Um, and usually all of our seed lots are above 99%, which they are very proud of. If, those, if purity passes, then you can move on to seeds per gram. Um, eight replicates of 100 seeds are weighed, and the average weight is used to calculate the seeds per gram. And that's what you use to um, determine the number of grams you need for your potential seedlings. So seeds per gram can vary greatly between different species. 
For white bark pine, um, it's a larger seed. You might only have six to 10 seeds per gram, but if you have really small uh, seeds like trembling aspen, you know, if you blow it, it'll scatter. Um, you can have up to like 10,000 seeds per gram, so a large difference there. We also do an x-ray on each seed lot to capture the initial seed quality. Um, you can easily tell if seeds are deteriorated or empty, in which case you could send it back to processing, be like, hey guys, there's a lot of empty seed, can you try redoing this? Um, oftentimes, it'll just be the embryo that's empty and they can't really separate that because there's still the mega gametophyte, which makes the weight really difficult to differentiate between seeds um, which actually still have embryos. Um, you can also check for insect damage, so sometimes we'll see megastigma larva inside still. Um, and you can look at embryo development, is it short, is it long in filling the cavity, which we want, as well as mega gametophyte shrinkage. So sometimes if nurseries don't use up all of their seed, they'll return the seed to be re-registered. And because it's been stratified and dried back and who knows what has happened at the nursery, how did they store it? Um, you'll see some shrinkage in the mega gametophyte. And for white bark pine, which is an endangered species, we'll actually use the x-ray to estimate the germination because we can't afford to destroy any seed. So technicians will each get a copy of the x-ray and we go through it with our highlighters marking the, um, the good seed and the bad seed. And we have a meeting um, and debate and that's how we determine our germination estimate. Okay, so germination testing. So we have four um, 100 C replicates which are soaked. So for most species, we'll use our vials to do standing water soak overnight. Um, for seed lots which with deeper dormancy, they tend to have more fungal issues. We'll actually do a running water soak. So those are our soak tanks, um, ranging from 48 hours to two weeks. And then after they're soaked, they're spread into germination dishes or put into bags or spread into AA dishes, depending on the species. And this is just to show you different test types for different species have different soak durations, um, different cold strat durations, um, different temperature regimes. So this is all based off of ISTA with some of our improvements. And then after cold stratification, the tests are moved into germinators, which are um, set at different temperature regimes. And technicians will actually go into the, each germ dish every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, looking at the germinants. Um, they'll pick out and record normal germinants, uh, which are four times the length of the seed, or two times for AB species. And we'll also note down if anything looks abnormal. So that's just a germ record. And we'll note down the abnormals, like is it reversed? Did the cotyledons come out first? Is it stunted? Like did the radical never grow? Um, did it rot before getting long enough to be called normal? And if the four rep replicates are very different from each other, it's out of tolerance. Um, I won't go into out of tolerance details, but there are lots of tables and ISTAs that determine um, what's out of tolerance. And it's built into our in-house program, which we call CONCEPT. Um, if it's out of tolerance, we'll actually repeat the test. So some of you may have gotten my emails apologizing, uh, saying, sorry, this test is out of tolerance. You'll have to wait another six, seven weeks because we're going to redo the test. Um, if the test result is also unexpectedly low, if it's a retest, you know, compared to the previous test, or I guess if it were very high, like way too high, then we would retest the seed lot just to make sure the result is as it should be. Yeah. Oops. Hold on. Okay. And some seed lots, depending on the species, are actually sent to the plant health laboratory in Abbotsford um, for fungal testing. So they'll actually put the seeds on media and then see what grows. And um, so they test mainly for fusarium or calicypha if the seed lot was collected via squirrel cache or for serococcus for uh, spruce seed lots. And if 
It comes back as high fungal, so a high um, fungal load. We'll actually flag it in the freezers, and whenever they're withdrawn, they'll actually get soaked separately, so not with other seed lots, just to make sure there's no contamination. So that was all our standard testing. We also do a lot of quality assurance testing. So for the processing side, we'll do cone or seed moisture content testing. It's basically just to see where is it at, you know, if cones have come in, they're super wet, um, or maybe just a little wet, and they want to know, is it dry enough to proceed with um, processing? They'll give it to us. We'll put it in the oven overnight, same procedure, weigh it, and then give them the moisture content. Um, if there's also gravity table separations in processing, so if they separate it into light, mid, and heavies, and they're not sure if they should keep all the portions, they might get us to test it. And if it's good, maybe they'll recombine all the portions. And for seedling requests, we'll also do germination testing. So for about 200 to 250 requests per year, we'll take a sample at shipping and actually start a germination test. This is just to see how did the seed actually do operationally. Because for our lab testing, it's quite a bit different. You know, it's small sample size, small vial, but in seedling requests, you might have like two kilos of seed being soaked at a time. Um, we'll actually also ask the nurseries, hey, how did you do? Can you give us your results? So we can compare our lab germ, our QA germ, and the nursery germ, just to see how the seed lots are actually doing in real life. Um, seedling requests of Western Red Cedar, Red Alder, and Paper Birch are very staticky. Um, they're pelletized for easier handling when sowing, so that's all these little white pebble-like things in our um, vitamin dish. We'll put 25, so let's see, yeah, 25 cells, um, have eight of those reps, and actually put water in them just to see do they break down quickly? Um, do they actually contain a seed? Do they contain more than one seed, which is not what we want? Or do they contain any debris? And I mentioned return seed before. And this is just a few examples of the trials we also do. So um, at our own um, initiative or at client request, we might test different stratification regimes. So like for spruce, we've been doing three week, our default versus six week cold stratification. Um, we've also done sanitation treatments such as peroxide trials on our Western Larch and x-rays. So I think Dave might go more into these trials later, so I'll just leave it at that for this. Um, that's just an example of the white bark pine. So we actually x-rayed individual seeds to see what they look like, and then we Sep or we kept them separate in germ dishes just to see if they would germinate. And some results were pretty surprising. Um, like seeds which looked like they shouldn't germinate, shouldn't germinate, germinated. Seeds that looked like they should have germinated, didn't germinate. So yeah. Um, this is just, if you have any seed testing needs, you can always contact me. And we do do testing for a fee if it's not standard registration. Yeah. This is just more resources. Um, so there's our Tree Seed Center website, as well as the Seed Handling Guidebook, which has a lot of good information. OK, and that's it for me. Pardon me? I'm just going to go. I have one. Oh, that I do need. Okay. All right, Victoria said I'm going to talk about some results, and that's not true. If you want to get an update on any of those results, you have to subscribe to the Tree Seed Working Group News Bulletin, and you'll see those in the next edition. All right, what I will talk about, sort of following on the testing theme, uh, seed research interpretation and, and pitfalls. I think that has something to do with my, my topic. Um, um, and I'm just going to jump right in. Um, so I was at a meeting and I was asked to talk about bridging seed science and application. How do we make sure that our research gets put into practice? And you know, following that, I really felt you know, there is a third uh, key to this. There is a third end, and that's really the policy regulations, the legislative goals. And really, I don't have it in a slide, but maybe the most important to the research community is the funding agencies. And that sort of gets all lumped 
behind here. So, so you know, what are some of our goals? And, and really, I'm going to really um, recognize the importance of basic science, and we need some of that basic science. But my focus is really how does science um, more closely flow into operations. So what do we want to do with seed science? We want to understand, explain, describe, predict. We want to seek the truth. And everybody's truth might be very different. So how do you go through the literature and determine what's useful to your facility and your operations and what isn't? Um, science is also supposed to help solve practical problems. Um, in application, we're meant to deliver a product, like seedlings, or we want to maximize germination of a seed lot. Uh, we want to minimize or reduce costs. A lot of the applications are in some sort of business. Um, so increasing efficiency, I see that very similar to solving problems and one of the real overlap areas. Um, and really, we want this sustained and consistent supply of seed. In terms of the policy, um, regulations, funding agencies, you know, setting up goals, boundaries, legal framework, uh, you know, some clear user-friendly guidance. This is all important. It sort of flows into this politics as well that we sometimes see, which I'm not going to talk about at all. But I think these cogs are all very important to recognize in terms of the system that we work. Um, we all know about the scientific method, and what, one of my main points, I'm not going to go through the the, the slides on the method, we, you know, we all come up with questions. Um, if we're good at observations, we come up with good questions. And those turns into hypothesis and go through experimentations. But this is really the center slide that I want to talk about. Everybody thinks if you publish something in the literature, that's the answer. And I really think we need to go beyond that. And in terms of hierarchy of evidence, I really love that terminology in terms of, you know, there's some promising expert opinion up to something that's very well supported where we have a systematic review of a topic. And I think it's important that we continue to, to look at uh, testing with evidence that way and how do we seek our truth. Um, one of my favorite graphs in terms of, I think, what many of us should be searching for, this is just a graph of looking at corporate impact versus scientific impact, and you know, the, the article was Reach for the Eagles. We want science to you know, be high in both those areas, but there really is room for dogs, there's room for sheep. We want to eliminate all the dogs that have low corporate impact, that have low scientific impact. Um, this is a diagram I've used a few times. I, I, I kind of love it. Um, a lot of the academics don't love it. Um, so it, it begins with this Gardner hype cycle, and it starts with some sort of techn uh, technology trigger here. And you know, basically, we have this inflated expectations. And that's really what research funding and granting is based on, on these inflated expectations. Unfortunately, those aren't realized or realized in the timescales that, 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 that people want. And so we get this trough of disillusionment. And that's where operational support vanishes. Um, you know, these things didn't come out of nowhere. There is some basis behind them. So there is this slope of enlightenment, and there's some sort of plateau of productivity here. And I think this is a really realistic cycle. And, you know, we shouldn't believe this, and maybe we shouldn't believe this. And how do we come to this sort of plateau of productivity a lot sooner? Um, one of the things I find with some of the technology advancements is that we're looking for problems for the latest tools versus selecting the appropriate tool for the problem. And sometimes it's that low-tech tool that is the appropriate tool for the problem that you're dealing with. Um, I, don't, I know you can't read that cartoon, um, and I can't even read it, but what... <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of funny. <laughs> what, what Wilson is, is working on is um, a way to make genetically modified organisms organic. Um, I'd like to review this sort of scientific review system. I think everybody's familiar with this publish or perish in academics. Um, sometimes it's also, you know, it's worthless unless it's published. So what do journals do? They disseminate information, they register authors' precedents, create key 
quality assurance through peer review and create an information archive. It's incredible, you know, what would we do without that? It's really, really valuable. But not all journals are the same. They have this thing called an impact factor, and this creates some sort of scientific currency. Um, and so publishers somehow become the gatekeepers of scientific prestige. Uh, does it encourage the needed research or the new and spectacular in these journals? And really, the question, who is running the knowledge bank? Who is really determining what funding is out there and for what? Um, it's also big business. 2017, $25.2 billion in the scientific publishing industry. In 2010, Elsevier had a higher profit margin than Apple, Google, or Amazon. And if people are interested, you know these presentations will be made available. This is a really interesting Guardian article titled, Profitable Business, Scientific Publishing Bad for Science. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, just made to uh, be extreme in the title, but it's a very interesting read. I suggest you do it. Um, so what is the current system? Scientists perform research, they give articles to publishers who get science to do the QA, the peer review, and sell, and sell it back to the libraries for scientists to use. Certainly we have these open access journals, but the costs are moving from the libraries back to the scientists who have to pay to get their research published. Um, this is sort of what I wanted to talk about as I've been involved in tree seed science for a long time. I see some of the pitfalls, stuff you don't usually get from reading the abstract, and I fear a lot of us are very busy. We often just read the abstract. So, you know, what's important? You know, the first thing is representative sample. When an article talks about Sitka spruce, I don't expect it to be based on a single seed lot. We know that our organisms, our tree, are the most heterogeneous organisms on the planet. Stephen mentioned that. I was very happy that you mentioned that. Um, and really, it often seems that whatever treatment we're applying gets way more consideration than the species. Um, I freak out when I see one seed lot in a paper. Um, and it's not as uncommon as you might think. Uh, people come to us for seed samples for research lots, you know, dozens a year and they're wanting one seed lot and try to convince them you really should look at a little more than that. You should look at a little more than that. And it's all, you know, often the promise that they're going to expand their sampling after publishing, but that rarely happens. So, you know, there's really very little in terms of validation uh, incentives. There's a lot of incentives to get something new and exciting out. Um, but is it real? Is it the truth? Um, a smaller example, germination testing. We, we talked about ISTAR, four replicates of 100 seeds. Maybe that isn't even enough with our high, highly variable crops. You know, that's all based on, on, on corn research. Um, but it's not uncommon to see papers of 4 by 50 or 4 by 25. And obviously, you know, it just decreases your precision of anything you're estimating. Uh, lack of an adequate control is something I, I found quite interesting and, you know, the do nothing is not really realistic because nobody's doing nothing. If you're not stratifying your conifer seed, I'll just come back to that example because it's common, and you apply electricity to it and you get a little bit of germination, that's not going to be convince me that I should be using electrical methods. You really should be comparing it to your standard, which is stratification. And so there's, there's just so much of that in the literature in terms of things that have overstated the benefits of seed treatments because, yes, they've compared it to a control, no treatment, but not a current treatment that is very uh, cheap and easy to perform. Um, interpretation, and, and this is science versus practice, and, you know, when I entered this has sort of been a bit lost. You know, when we're looking at the benefit of a practice on operations, it's best to just test that seed lot. Well, when we're really looking at scientific principles, you want to base that on filled seeds only. Uh, you know, you can correct for viable seeds, but oftentimes you're going to reduce your sample size and create very unequal replicates. Um, historically, scientists have gone to a lot of work to make sure they're dealing solely with filled seeds in their experiments, and it is quite labor-intensive. Um, 
Statistical interpretation, interactions, this comes up quite a bit. Uh, you know, main factors are, are often, and the more complex, for an example, a factorial experiment you become, the, the more you're guaranteed that you're going to have interactions, and you really shouldn't be drawing any main conclusions on those main effects. So what do you do? You separate it by treatments or factors, and that's limited in terms of how you can interpret it. Um, you can do tests with specific contracts. That's probably the most appropriate statistical method. Or you can treat them all as random variables and look at percent of the variance and really determine what are your most important factors. Um, sixth, treatment feasibility. Um, and really, probably my last point here is under, really understanding the problem, not what you want to do to solve the problem uh, up front. You know, can treatments be bulked up to an operational scale? Um, sometimes we find things that are just too cumbersome or costly, and this really has to be thought up, up front. Um, and I think it's really critical to involve operations early. Um, this research and development, you can't read that, an ongoing effort to develop or improve products and services often undertaken by teams of highly skilled scientists and engineers. And what's missing, you know, there's no mention of operations being involved who will actually be using those results. Uh, statistical significance, you know, we're all ingrained with alpha 0.05. Uh, you know, it's, it's the standard. You know, give me something that makes a big difference at 85% confidence and I'll take it and run with it and I'll, uh, I'll absorb that risk. There is always some risk involved. And, you know, you've got to balance what your benefits and risks are. And sometimes I think we just get caught up in this very rigid statistical interpretation. And, I, and I'm a big proponent of, you know, the way we look at things, which is continuous improvement versus, versus continually, this is the answer and we're done and there's no more to say about this. Um, so really, we're just stepping stones. And the people before me, uh, what they did correct, is what I'm, you know, just following. Um, science is gonna change over time. What I say today may be proven wrong tomorrow. Uh, hopefully I'm giving some stepping stones that are, are moving things forward in the right directions. Um, the thing I've highlighted, this is what I often face with. We, we, you need some policies and you use the best information to put those policies in place. Uh, people don't recognize that. Time goes by and it turns into uh, mantra or myth. Not understanding there wasn't great information to go. And you really, I think, have to go back and question some of the assumptions that you're doing. And that's always a healthy thing to question your assumptions. Um, this little icon here, I just saw a, a program in the United States, scientists engaging and educating decision makers. I thought there should be another program, Operations Engaging and education, Educating Scientists. A um, few little um, Daniel Locke, uh, I sort of like these continuous improvement principles in terms of stop fixing and start improving. You know, it's no good just to correct the problem, let's try to improve it. Um, this was obviously written by a manager here, but really anybody can have that idea to initiate a change. Best practices are possibly the ones you already have. Um, you know, how do you reward innovation within your organization? Borrowing or buying something from abroad who isn't familiar with your specific context, it's really gonna put you behind. You know, there are times to look outwards, but really a lot of your answers that are your situation specific are already there. Changing behavior is often more important than changing processes, and it isn't always easy. You know, change management is a contact sport. People will just generally be resistant to it. Um, if you aren't failing, you aren't trying. And, you know, you have to try things to learn. Uh, and I'm talking about small-scale uh, experimentation that can pay off in big ways. Some experiments will fail. Make sure you don't fail the same way again. And, you know, something I'm faced with, I'm very fortunate that part of my role is still within the realm of extension. We used to have a very large extension 
group. I was fortunate to be at an operation facility that survived, and I continued to uh, be able to engage in extension. Uh, but I really see this divide. Science is going deeper and deeper with new technologies to unravel the truth, and the gaps between science and application is widening. And I really look at this as a Grand Canyon. So, you know, when did technology transfer die? You know, we really need it more than ever. Um, you know, I, 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 we try our best at the Tree Seed Working Group. Certainly kudos up to uh, the USDA and their, their Ringer Reforestation Nurseries and Genetic Resources Group for putting out a lot of great material as well. And one last slide. Just things that are top of my mind. Please participate. <laughs> Tree Seed Working Group, whatever organization you can be involved with, whether it's nursery seed um, related. And I think this whole issue of encouraging support and fund technical extension is really going to pay dividends. We need to get that great science into practical applications and ensure operations are involved in prioritizing and designing research, make sure scientists understand the real problem and want to work on it. Um, and scientists, policymakers, and practitioners all have to play a role in educating and being educated. You all have to talk and you all have to listen. And question your long-held assumptions. You know, what are they based on? That's it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm still, I think I'm just going to leave time. So there's one announcement from Raju. So anyone who's uh, joining the Poplar and Willow Council, the AGM starts at 1 p.m. in the Thompson Room. And then there's a Armstrong Municipal Wastewater Plantation. There's a bus or some, some what? Some fleet vehicles. Some fleet vehicles. Okay. So there's fleet vehicles leaving for that plantation tour um, to meet in the lobby at 3:40 p.m. If you'd like to do that. Um, so we've got about five to ten minutes before lunch. So I just because we had to kind of speed through this morning. And thank you again to all the speakers. There are gifts for you all um, who came to visit, and for everyone as well. There's also posters. The tree seed poster. Um, so anyone that wants to take one at any point in the day, please do. And there's more we can roll up. Um, so I just want to give some time for breathing and thoughts and questions. So does anybody have any questions for any of the speakers this morning that you were waiting on? Actually, we, we do need it for recording. Okay, <laughs> for recording. Uh, you mentioned compaction as a potential issue, and I'm just wondering if you do any uh, measurements or any follow-up on that as, I mean, those big lifts are thousands of pounds uh, in the orchards and what impact those might have. Certainly. Um, so for compaction for us, like we uh, actively try to minimize the amount of passes that we make throughout the orchard. Um, we have been noticing a little bit of compaction in our larger orchards uh, with our larger trees. However, we haven't um, gone through and actually tested that, but we have looked into some potential um, things that we could do to mitigate that, such as aerating. Um, so we're looking into um, just renting an aerator, so it's like has spikes that will go through the ground to kind of break up some of that soil, so that's something we can do. And the, the more passes that we get in those orchards, the more CMP that we do, the more that we're noticing the need for that. So it hasn't been a major issue yet, but in the future it could be. So we want to be proactive in preventing any of those. Okay. Um, yeah, so compaction is a major issue for us. Now, you guys are blessed in the region that you are in because you have naturally the number one thing that counteracts compaction, which is freeze, your ground freeze. Um, so what we do in response to that in the southeast is we can rip, we can run a 12-inch shank down the rows of our orchards. We do that when the soil is very dry and try to get a shattering effect. Um, outside of that, we don't have a lot of tools. Now, we're operating a lot of equipment, a lot of machinery, and there are companies that are looking more in depth into that. In fact, there's some research being done at NC State um, with a tensiometer and looking at soil density and compaction. So, in short, we can do a better job, and I think considering the rows that you're using, like Courtney's saying, is, is very important. Um, and then there's other there's other options like considering your soil texture. We used to we used to operate a lot on loamy sands. Now we're shifting to kind of sandy loams. 
I'm sorry, opposite of that. Uh, but uh, just try to find soils, textures that don't compact as much. Thank you. A uh, question to Dave. Could you elaborate a little bit more about this issue of the need of extension? Because we, as I work in a state university in Mexico as researcher, and we are rated based, as you uh, insinuated, based on how many papers do you publish and what is the impact factor. And as higher is the impact factor, more sophisticated need to be the paper. And that makes harder to uh, digest that for practitioners. So in Mexico, we have journals that are in Spanish that the practitioners read, but the impact factor is very small. So if you publish there, you are a second-rated researcher. So there is an incentive to do not do extension as researchers. So how do you solve that, or how do you suggest to solve that? Uh, well, I think we need people dedicated to extension. So I, we need people like you to continue all that same research. We need the people who are already applied, but we need people in between. And, you know, I, from what I hear, you know, those people have vanished from almost all jurisdictions. And, you know, I guess my main theme is we need those people again, and we need them more than ever because science is that much more distant from practical application. Um, so I think we need dedicated people to extension. So I'm not asking you to do more work. <laughs> Just a quick comment on your uh, last talk. It's a lot along the line to my philosophy, and it was neat about six or eight months ago uh, some special editors of a journal contacted me and they said, we want to write a special issue on genomics and like tree improvement, separating hype from reality. So there's a series of papers coming out and whatever like that too. And it's interesting to read some of those, even by people who are molecularly involved. You know, there was one by uh, an author from North Carolina State where he essentially says there's a golf, a golf between the researcher and the applied. And, and whatever like that too, and really need to bring that closer together if we're gonna get practical. Or like when I'm doing work over in Hawaii with COA, I talked to some people many years ago and I said, we'll solve your problem. I won't be able to tell you how many genes there are, I won't be able to tell you the underlying mechanism, but if I waited till I had all those answers, you wouldn't be planting the species, and, and they are, so. Patrick? Well, as a, as a career scientist, I just wanted to point out one of the amazing advantages that this community has. So, you know, I work on a lot of stuff. I work on cycads. Most recently, I spent five years working on them. Who cares about cycads? Worked on needum, ginkgo, all sorts of species that are completely unimportant. For me to work on those species and get a reputable paper out of it, I have to have replication. And that's really hard. Things that you see in botanical gardens are almost useless to science because you can't do replicates. So what do you guys have? You've got unbelievable replication. You have genomic depth. You have all of this stuff that makes it supremely attractive for scientists, especially evolutionary scientists. So there's a, a crap ton of opportunity in this community, which is deep, has huge experience, and you know has a shelf life, unlike working on psychics, where you're doing it maybe for two or 300 years from now for one person to read that paper. But in this stuff, it's almost immediate. You get feedback. It's an interesting area to work in as a scientist. So when Dave says, yeah, extension is needed, that's true because extension is the bridge that takes you right into science. Um, scientists have a lot of failure. You don't see that. You don't see my black lab books of you know, unrepeatable experiments or unrepeatable ideas, but they're not even possible without your community. So I'm just saying it's a, a bigger opportunity and it should be seized certainly by managers in government. Are there any government managers here? Any more? Robert? 
I, I just have a comment. It's about extension. I feel like we have to do our own extension, like go to Cisco, keep our eyes open for, hey, I could use something like that in the orchard or at the ABCFP conference, like keep our eyes open for stuff people are doing in forest research and how we can apply it in our orchards, like like that thing I presented but, or, and stuff like that. We got to do it ourselves. Hello. Um, you know, we had a, this is probably 20, 25 years ago, we had a fellow here and he really talked about extension in terms of th three things. Um, uh, education, extension, and communication. A and they're different. Communication is what you do with the public. Um, education is what you do with people who are newly entering a field. And the extension is what you do with the people who are you know, already in the field want to extend their knowledge. And we have to look at all three of those prongs, I think, because we want our messages, what we're doing. We are doing good work, and, you know, people should be aware of that to all three of those prongs. They're all important. So, yeah, uh, we all need to do extension. But I think there does need to be dedicated people who are going to move that basic science or deeper science into more applications. Are we hungry? Deal. I'm starving. Yeah, thanks. I think this question is for you, David. I mean, Stephen, I think you can help us in some ways. One of the big problems that we have in Western Canada is corn production in large pine. Okay, this is a problem in BC and Alberta. And uh, they have tried uh, many different uh, ways of promoting corn production, including gibberic acid in, in injection and other things that, that it probably don't work that much like they do in spruce. But uh, I was trying at some point to find if there are some other pines that have similar problems. And uh, I came across uh, an old publication in septic uh, proceedings many years ago where uh, I think uh, Loblory Pine had uh, the same problem as the beginning when they started the programs. And uh, at some point they tried uh, spacing and they found that uh, actually if you increase spacing between trees and they, that was able to promote uh, corn production by 300%. But they were also concerned about uh, the p potential problem of managing solitary trees that could promote uh, self-pollination. So I thought that maybe with the pine, we may have a, a simple problem that is actually how much we space trees between each other. So you coming from the south with the pine, how much spacing is still part of your management uh, approach in promoting seed production in a um, pine, which we in Western Canada can learn from? Yeah. So comb production for loblolly has not been as problematic as some of the conifer species you guys deal with. Um, we're, we're very blessed in that factor. Uh, that being said, we still, we, we still want to produce comb product, producting facilities, and, and that's, that's in the, the tops of our crowns. The way that we do that with loblolly is large leaf fertilization, um, ample nitrogen in the, in the summer, late summer, really correlates strongly with cone initiation in the spring. Uh, from a spacing standpoint, I, I have not, I'm not familiar with research that's looking at spacing and densities in order to promote cone, conelet production. Uh, we generally use a 20 feet by 20 feet, maybe 30 by 30 feet type of metrics, but we're trying to take advantage of the small land base that we have and get as many ramets early as we can and, and then go ahead and rogue. Um, I wish I could help out more, but most of the species that we deal with uh, in the South are, are, are not maybe not great. Longleaf is, is kind of fickle with comb production, um, but not quite the same as the species you guys deal with. Um, have, the, have the last word on this, <laughs> and then we're gonna break for lunch. I, I really think lodgepole pine is different, and I think if we're expecting some sort of cone production like our other conifers, we're looking in the wrong direction. You know, this is a species that evolved to put on a canopy seed bank 
and not to have these bumper crop years. And so I, I think there's just intrinsic biology that we're going to be in more of a steady state flow uh, of seed versus these bumper crops. And if, if you're looking for other things, I suggest, you know, this rottenest species is where to look. I think that's the key to try to improving practices. Lunch is right next door. Let's get back here for one o'clock, I believe. One o'clock, please. <laughs>